Hi, and uh, welcome to our December instalment of Free Your Mind, where we're joined by Neelam Hira, founder of Sisters. Welcome, Neelam. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. No, we're really excited to have you and uh, to have you share the narrative and explore the narrative around uh, reproductive uh, mental health and well-being. Uh, could you just um, start off by maybe introducing yourself and letting everybody know the story behind and the journey behind S uh, Sisters? Sure. So Sisters started off as a almost like a one woman campaign. Um, so I grew up um, having really debilitating periods. And when I say debilitating, I mean, they were heavy, they were sporadic, um, they lasted a really long time, but then they were absent at some times. And I was in so much pain that I would take either time off university um, because I was living away from home so I could get away with not going in. Um, I went sort of back and forth to the GPs and I got first diagnosed with um, PCOS. And that was at 18. And then later on, my pain was getting worse. I collapsed and later on got diagnosed with endometriosis. And it was all those sort of experiences about how medical professionals sort of treated me in that space. And as well as this cultural thing around having these conditions that affect fertility and how that was perceived by other people that really honestly made me angry. Um, I felt um, as a, a young woman at that point that there was a lot of burden placed on me to be a healthy um, childbearing female that has to get married by like the age of 26. And I really felt that pressure. And when I sort of told people about having these, these conditions, which could affect fertility, I was almost told to keep them quiet because, you know, people in the community, they don't want to speak about this. And it's a really bad thing to talk about. And, you know, it'll ch affect my chances of getting married because I may not be able to have kids. And in all honesty, it really annoyed me. And I thought, I can't be the only one that's going through this journey. I'm not the only person that's ever experienced this. Um, so I started talking about it through social media, um, through my own social media first. Um, and you might or might not be surprised that I actually, when I started talking about things like pelvic pain, vaginas, and talking about these, these words, this terminology, I got trolled. Um, and I was a bit like, and it was, it was always South Asian men, um, usually from abroad, who thought it was appropriate to send messages that were really concerning, actually, um, and say things to me because they thought that I was talking about something that was sexually promiscuous. So that added another layer of complex issues to an already hard journey. And I realized that this isn't a thing that's just happening to me. This is a view that's shared by a lot of men. It, that anything that's related to a vagina or related to pelvic um, floor or pelvic pain, pelvic muscles, is all seen as promiscuous and it's all seen as you should only talk about it if you're having children. And, and I think that really inspired where sisters came from. So to sort of almost deflect some of the trolling that was happening to me personally, I made sisters as a, a sort of a collaboration of different women going through these conditions. And um, it, it sort of got rid of the trolling that was very direct to me at the time. And it changed things um, to becoming a platform for other people of color. And um, as we know, when you're a person of color, you've got additional barriers to acceptance within the community. And the way you're treated by the NHS, because we know um, when we go and see a GP and stuff, there's always uh, some sort of unconscious bias about our condition, or we don't feel comfortable enough to speak to a GP properly about this condition, because we've been taught for so many years that anything pelvic related is dirty, or it's wrong, or you might have caused it. And the more and more I started exploring sisters and speaking to people on their journeys, I actually learned that a lot of women who are much older than me, so I'm 31 now, but much, much older than me at the time, were blamed by their families for having these conditions. So then you've not only got a debilitating condition, you've got the social stigma, you've got this marriage stigma, but you've also got your family blaming you for a condition and gaslighting you from being able to open up and say I'm in pain or this has happened to me and we've had quite a few women who you know the families really believe in things like karma and they believe that the reason they're going through this level of pain now or cancer so a gynecological cancer is either because they've been sexually promiscuous 
or they've been sexually promiscuous in a previous life. And having sex doesn't actually cause these conditions. It's got nothing to do with it. And I think it's these stigmas that stop women getting the help um, coming forward and they live in pain for such a long time. Um, so the average diagnosis time for endometriosis alone is seven and a half years till diagnosis. And that is part, not just because of the GPs, we've got to take some responsibility ourselves. This is a lot to do with the misogyny and patriarchy within our community, stopping women coming forward. And what started off as a bit of a movement, like a one angry woman crusade almost, has really started um, sort of a collaborative of other sisters who have gone through this journey, who want change, who want to become advocates. And I think, What's really important for me is there's so much misinformation, in, in, especially within South Asian communities around what is this condition. So what we want to try and do, which is such a basic thing, is disseminate the information from the NHS, act as that sort of conduit, and bring it into those communities and say, this is what the condition is. No, it's not caused by sex. This is what you can do to manage it. This is how you manage it in the workplace, and this is how you live with it and you're not the only one. It's about making people feel like they're not the only person. So the reason that we started being reproductive and mental health is because, as you probably appreciate, the NHS is so understretched, overworked, underpaid, the whole thing. People, when they go for their appointments, they're not treated holistically. So you'll be treated for, for example, the endometriosis, the fibroids, the PCOS, but no one asks you, how are you? How are you coping with this? And that was the point of sisterhood. Having other people going through this journey, me being able to reach out to my own sisters in this and say, I'm in pain today. What have you taken? What are you doing? Um, has been really, really helpful. Like little thing, I'll show you something now, actually. Um, I came across this. This is a, a hot water bottle and you can wrap it around yourself. Now, when I'm in having a flare up day, I can wrap this around myself. Now, I wouldn't have never come across this from a GP, but from my sisterhood, this tribe of amazing people who were like, I use this, it's amazing. I've come across things like heat pads, TENS machines, and recommended specific ones through this group. And I think that power of peers and sisters is so, so important in this journey. Neela, my, I've got um, I've got questions. You know, in terms of the, the collaboration and, and how powerful um it is and 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 we know that you can definitely learn lots from other people but especially when you've got so much stigma associated with what you're describing you need a safe space yeah don't you and, and you need people to open up and I guess that's that's leading into my question around do you feel uh with sisters that people are now opening up because it's been a number of years um yeah. you know since since you since you've started and I think it's it's great that there's, there's a forum, there's a space for, for people going through those experiences um, to be open. But do you yeah. feel that that is happening or do you think there's still a little bit of uh, resistance, but based on the stigma and how they might be perceived if they do share? I, it's a bit of both. So this is a really interesting one. So Sisters has been around for coming up to six years now. Um, that just shows how old I'm getting, doesn't it guys? Um, so, as you probably appreciate, at the age of 25, wanting to go and talk to a 25 year old about these issues when you're much older is probably seen a lot difficult compared to speaking to a group of someone who's older. And I think because it was so new then and no one really understood me, my journey and why it was there, it was almost people were a bit hesitant. And what I've noticed is in the community generally, um, Sisters um, was really fortunate to sort of win awards and things. And I think that's when it was actually a turning point. People almost thought that Neelam's got this award. Essentially, it's a paperweight that sat in my room somewhere. But because I had this sort of award from someone and someone had almost endorsed us, suddenly it became, it must be, you know, they must be telling the right things. It must be important. And I think so it's been a, a, bit, a bit of both, really. And I didn't, I never actually believed awards and things were important, but actually I think there's so much emphasis and trust placed in them that actually it's more important than I ever realized. And that's probably my naivety as well, being a 25 year old at the time. Um, and I think now we've had sort of established growth over the years. Um, 
the last actually in-person meeting we did was last Christmas because of COVID. It wasn't worth risking people coming out this year. But um, we had people join that. And it was a nice Christmas meeting and things. But we had people join that who have been part of Sisters for at least three years, but decided to come out and meet for the first time because they felt comfortable enough. And I think that just shows the level of that insecurity within these communities. And I think one thing that keeps getting said to me often is, there is actually more people that know each other in Sisters or they know each other's family. The Asian community isn't that big, not really, especially when you're working, like, so the work that we've done has been very Birmingham based and now we've spread out, but the meetings we've done in Birmingham and two people have known each other. And at the end of the meeting, they were like, oh, can you, can you keep it in this room? And that's one thing that we always say, everything in the room stays in the room. It's a safe space, but it's that fear, isn't it? Of the auntie's going to find out down the road about me and my marriage issues and my, you know, my fertility issues. And because it is a space for these people to sit and cry about it and laugh about it and everything in between. And it is that fear that auntie down the road is going to find out and go and tell everybody and I think it's that that stops people coming forward more than anything. Um, Neil, I've got a question for you. Um, do you, I know are you saying that obviously over the years um, you've seen the changes, but do you think there is you know a change in um, the perception from the Asian community at the moment, or do you see that happening slowly? Um, Yes and no. I feel it's, it's interesting because I feel sometimes I'm in an echo chamber. So everyone around me is like, yeah, this is great. You all think this is great. So everyone must think this is great. But actually, if you, for example, I've taken this into a Godwara before and I was asked not to come back um, because one of the committee members, who's a male, felt that the work I was doing around sisters, not in the actual session, was wrong. So I did a TED talk on virginity and how it's a social construct. And someone had seen it, sent it to the committee and said, this is wrong. She shouldn't be in the God that I'm talking about. Um, I was actually talking about cervical smears with um, an Amrit Dari doctor, but it was still wrong because I talk about virginity as well. And I would rather people have safe um, consensual sex and understand it than not. And I think that's important and it's part of our remit of our work. So actually, attitudes haven't changed because the people that are still in power now are, are unfortunately men and if you ask men about some of these topics we talk about they will shy away from it and they will they won't want to talk about it so we have a really long way to go you might see things on instagram which is great you know on social media where it looks as though we're seeing change but in the actual community itself because we follow these committees we follow these you know god places of worship and if those people at the top that we follow don't like the work you're doing and, and find it sexually promiscuous or they think it's wrong then actually we've still got a problem yeah I think yeah. Um, sorry um yeah I think you know it, how do we sort of go about that within our own households I mean just from my own experiences as as a young child you know periods it wasn't talked about yeah. I mean for my brothers for my dad we don't we never spoke about it it was something like that was hidden um yeah. So how do we go about it? What, what can we do within our own households? And, you know, what's the way forward, really, to make it, um, you know? Think, um, it's a difficult one. We can't change what's happened in the past, but we have got an opportunity now to change the future. So I think with the households now that we create, we have those open conversations. We engage with communities that are doing this work. We get we get people in front of a screen or a community and have those conversations because we can't change the mind of elderly communities. We can't do that. We can't change years of intergenerational trauma around the subject. We, we can't change that, but we can break that cycle and we can be part of a change now. And I think that's what we have to look at going forward rather than fixing something that's, you know, it's not gonna work, is focus on the new. Definitely, yeah. I've just got a question as well. In terms of uh, when, you, when you were diagnosed, um, and obviously I'm, I'm assuming you spoke to your family about it. Yeah. Um, how did your parents um, and your, those close to you um, react and what were their, what did you find from them basically? So I've had a really different upbringing. Um, my mom is actually at one point taught sex education, really unheard of for a, a South Asian woman, right? Um, and so I think around conversations like that, I've been really fortunate. Um, 
because we've had open conversations at home. I actually remember, and my mom still cusses me to this day. So when I actually came on my period, um, standing at the top of the stairs and I shouted, I've started. <laughs> and then my mom like came up the stairs. She had a really annoyed look on her face. She was like, you didn't need to like shout it in the whole house. Like you didn't need to. And I was like, I'm scared. Um, and I remember we, we talked about it and we you know talked about how to use uh, period products and things like that. And I don't think, many people especially of my age and maybe older have had those experiences with their families um and I've also seen like with cousins and other family members how they've had complete opposite experience and they found my experience too liberal almost it's almost inviting like Neelam go out and do whatever you want because it's been an open conversation so when the, my mom actually had um, an idea that I had PCOS before I did because obviously she's she's a nurse so she kind of realized that my periods were sporadic she realized that I was in pain and actually it was quite empowering of her to let her to let me get my diagnosis for myself rather than my mom shipping me around and telling me um, you need this and you need that. I think me getting the diagnosis by myself in uni was a big moment for me and sort of my journey into adulthood almost. Um, so she she wasn't surprised at all. With PCOS and with endo and, and most of these conditions, they do advise things like contraceptive pills to manage a lot of the conditions. Um, and um, I didn't you know, I was quite nervous about taking this because I thought everyone's going to see it and think I'm taking them, you know, I'm taking them because I'm having sex. And I was really worried about that. Um, but because my mom understood it, I'd never had that problem. However, externally with other members of the family and with other people, um, friends of mine all thought it was it was just a cover. It was because, you know, I'm having sex. So that therefore, that's the only reason you'd take the pill. So that was really interesting how it was actually my peers and other family members that actually hassled me the most around taking the contraceptive pill. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, um, in terms of, I know you've had a, so you, you it was quite open, um, openly discussed in your household. Now, like you already mentioned, in a lot of other households, it's not such an open discussion like I'll be honest in my household we never ever spoke about anything of that sort um what advice would you give for whether it's uh, a young person that's going through that or uh, or the parents um in that house or what kind of advice would you give for those people who are going or experiencing something similar to what you've just what you've experienced okay so something some advice that I've given like recently um young woman diagnosed with PCOS um she found that she it it doesn't just affect fertility and I think because in the community we think it's just a fertility issue and that's it naturally it's a metabolic lifelong condition and not many people know that um, it's one of its number one issues is actually causing things like heart disease um, type 2 diabetes um, obesity things like that now if you went and spoke, sat down your family and had all them facts properly and explained these are the things that this condition can cause and these are the things that can help this condition you're more likely to have an engaged conversation. If you go in there with the whole, this is gonna, this is gonna affect my fertility, which it might not in every case, it's a different conversation. And I think about, I think a lot of it is about understanding the condition. There are still people that have had this condition for years, and I'm still teaching them now that your risk of heart disease is the biggest thing. And you know, you learning to lead a better lifestyle. Um, it's a metabolic condition. They are learning this now you know 10 years after diagnosis and that's that shouldn't be the case it should be learned when you get your diagnosis because you know god forbid if you had cancer you would be told everything about that cancer you would know everything about that but with these conditions i find that they're so little talked about it's really easy to spread that misinformation so i think getting the right information working with organ i mean you can always get in touch with organizations like sisters and you know we can put together some material for you that puts you know all the information in a really nice accessible way for everybody and the pros and cons of if you have to take the pill but it's just about knowing the subject first if you go in there with half the facts it's really easy to read in between the lines and come up with something completely different. Neil, you know you spoke about um like it's seven it could be up to seven and a half years before uh receiving a diagnosis yeah that's a long that's a very long time. Yeah. So what would be, 
but what would be the detrimental impact of that and what would what would you say um you you would want more women to do so that you haven't got that you know that seven and a half year wait so it's a combination. We, we know that there's problems and we, we actually spoke at the old parliamentary group the other day on endometriosis. Um, obviously with COVID, all laparoscopies, anything to do with contraceptive pills, um, taking marina coils out or putting them in, everything's been on hold for the year. So you've got almost like a year's backlog as well. Now, there's, there's, two, there's two issues here. When women go and present themselves at the GP and say they're heavily bleeding, they're in a lot of pain, I'd say nine times out of 10, they're told to monitor it for a couple of months and then come back. Um, and it, that happens back and forth because that's what essentially happened to me. And it happens to a lot of people. And I think women aren't listened to, you know, there's this whole thing of women are hysterical. And, you know, there's an all parliamentary report that's been published called um, Better for Women. And it's all essentially it boils down to GPs need to listen to women which is really sad that in 2020, we need to tell GPs to listen. Um, but I think because for so many years, we've kind of kept this whole periods are painful, keep calm, carry on, chin up, we'll be fine approach. We've kind of made a bit of a rod for our own backs in that respect. Um, for me, if you are convinced that you're in pain and you know your body better than anyone, it's to start logging it. So for me, I've noticed, um, I get bloated and in pain very quickly when I eat gluten um, and that and a lot of people with endometriosis or PCOS find they have a flare up when eating gluten. Um, there's no research done into it, but I know it works for my body. So I've cut it out and other people will cut out red meat, cut out dairy, things that are basically inflammatory to the body because it's essentially an inflammatory disease. Um, but the detrimental impacts of letting something like endometriosis sort of continue to grow. Um, think of it as a weed. If you've got a weed, it just continues to continue to grow around your body. It go, it can go, um, depending on the how extreme the circumstances, it can go onto your bowels. Um, there's been instances where it's been found in the lungs. Um, and I think, I, you know, God willing that, you know, that doesn't happen to anyone. And, you know, we want to try and stop that sooner. But in order to help a GP, if, if say, for example, I've been in pain for the last couple of weeks, months, however, if I could go into a GP and just say, these are all the records, on Monday, I had this level of flare up. It was on a pain scale of one to 10. Um, I felt like A, B and C. Um, my mood was A, B and C. And these are the things that I ate. If you track that, then the GP can't actually turn around and ignore that. And you can also ask to be sent to a gynecologist or an endocrinologist to, to get them tests. One thing that I have really found that works with pushing a GP um, is because I'm sure you've all experienced this when your GP, you've gone to see them and they've kind of brushed you off and say you've asked for a referral, they've kind of been like, don't think you need one. We need to explore these other options first. Tell them to note that. Tell them to make a note on your file that you've asked to be referred somewhere and they have said no. Because nine times out of 10, they will not want to write that down um, because they do not want a litigation claim against them later on and they will make that referral. And What's also really good, um, but it's quite hard for you know some communities, especially if you've never navigated the NHS. The NHS is um, works on NICE guidelines. So NICE guidelines are the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. They have guidelines for everything. If you look at those guidelines and sort of follow the the treatment plan, you should know what works for you. So for example, um, it's, they start with contraceptives first, and they move on to um, like the implant. So I've got a marina coil in because it gives me um, the hormones that are localized, which help me personally. For someone else with endometriosis, it might not work for them. They might need you know further interventions, etc. It completely different to each person. But if you sort of navigated that that system yourself and read through those notes you can't be brushed off and when a gp knows that you have done your homework they're they're likely to take you seriously but i think what's sad to say about all of this is that we have to do that in the first place yeah need i was just going to say that i mean the fact that we have to do that when yeah. you really should be the gp's job yeah. to be helping you with that um but on that you mentioned like yourself with the when you eat gluten it, it flares up um mm -hmm. Is it, does it mainly tend to be uh, what you're consuming or is it other things that can affect it as well? 
though stress can really affect it i've noticed when i get really stressed out i really it's, it's interesting because i because i've got more than one condition i never know which one it is that's causing the issue um but i you know i have everyone has some breakouts and things but mine are horrific I notice when I don't eat properly and when I'm stressed, um, so hair grows back. So with PCOS, um, you can get hair growth and I get hair like really badly here, like my chin, like horrific. Um, I'm constantly lasering myself. And I think that, again, that's a subject we just don't talk about, do we? Like body hair and, you know, what's normal, what's not. Um, and I think um, that's when I start noticing. If I start seeing like a, like a shadow going on, I think, no, I've not been eating properly. I'm really stressed. I need like to take some time out for myself, start looking after myself again. Um, I think because there's not a lot of research done into this, these conditions generally, it's really hard to say that lifestyle is the main culprit of the, you know, making the condition worse. But I think on a personal level, I think if you speak to a lot of people with these conditions, they will tell you lifestyles made a big improvement to them. It's not not for everybody. I mean, um, my mom's already celiac, so there could be sort of inherent stuff for me with being gluten free anyway. Um, but for me, it works. Um, for other people, it doesn't. Um, and I think it's it's about understanding your body. And I think we don't often do that, do we? We don't, we don't sit and think this isn't working for me. We just carry on and carry on. And I think because we've got so used to this really nine to five burnout lifestyle, we just consume whatever we can whatever's convenient and I don't think that works anymore not for our bodies and not for us yeah so I think, I think, I think the main thing is to just log log anything really I think yeah. if it flares up you know whether your stress levels are high or what you're eating or yeah. whatever it is and just sort of keep track on it yourself I guess yeah. um I know before we before we started the call you mentioned um period poverty um so you know with the group our sisters um so would you like to just dive into what that is and yeah sure so sisters like it kind of blew up we wanted to do everything we wanted to save everybody and um so we did lots of different projects so some of them are around um about education in the communities about peer support but one thing that i learned in birmingham a good couple of years ago is that people that have periods if they're homeless or in schools they're not getting access to um, menstrual products and that absolutely shocked me now as somebody who needs a lot of menstrual products I at my worst bleeding I think I bled through two pads in an hour and for like a full week or two and that was my worst now could you imagine if that was me and I couldn't afford having menstrual products that would be horrific it would be like a scene from a horror movie it would be horrific and I just thought to myself like could you imagine going through the education system going through school and not being able to afford them and having a choice between food and that and one of the the sort of workshops that we did in one of the schools um they sort of explained that it was a choice between having the good meat or and and not having the sanitary products and because like the household is still dominated by males the good meat was more important um and i think that's something that we see a lot in really the deprived communities of birmingham so what we essentially started doing on a, on a small scale at the beginning was um working with you know corporates asking them to donate you know just bring just bring a sanitary pad box in and we'll donate them to schools um, we started working in the Hansworth area with Hansworth School of Association. Um, and there's th about 31 schools under them. We used to just drop them off and they used to distribute it. Um, what we found over the years that the demand has grown, especially in this period of COVID, where we are now supplying to food banks, um, other charities, anyone that needs it, we're trying to get stuff to them. We've expanded our reach. So we're, you know, I'm based in Birmingham, but we're also doing it in parts of London, um, Tamworth, which is an area that's, you know, really socially deprived as well, but is always forgotten about as part of the Midlands. So Lichfield we're getting into now, but we're trying to access as many areas as possible. That support is only, you know, being able to be done by sort of support of other products and partners. So I'll just show you now what we get. Um, we done some partnership with Hey Girl, who um, have a scheme. I don't know if you can read it, actually. It's um, buy one, give one. So when you buy one of these in, say, Tesco, Sainsbury's or whatever, they give one to a charity like us. Um, and in this box alone, there's 28, 24 boxes 
of, of products. So at the minute I've got about 4,000 of these in the house, which will be going out and we get like a pallet full um, and we just keep shipping them out. We've got some great volunteers that drop them off to food banks and things, but COVID's really, really showed as a massive demand recently of us having to just get it out to places, which is great that we can do it. It's also sad we can do it considering that obviously Scotland have actually made these products for free. So I'd love to see the UK follow suit, to be honest. Yeah, I was just going to mention, um, I saw something about Scotland making them making it free at the minute. Um, another thing that's in the media at the minute is the, um, the Stand With Farmers protests in India. Yeah. And I saw something about that, and which was quite nice to see that they're actually providing sanitary products for the women there. Yeah. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's brilliant. I'm so glad because it just acknowledges the woman's place there, doesn't it? Because... As a community, women are so underlooked all the time. And now I feel like actually our rights are, are, as being part of that movement is actually being recognized by these small little acts. Now, if we can do it there, we can do it in the homes. We can do it anywhere, can't we? And now I feel like we're getting to a point where we can start having those conversations because we're doing it there. Just another question um, in terms of, um, obviously, you, you talked about what you've been doing um, within not only in Berg Birmingham, but also outside of Birmingham as well. Um, what else do you think we can do as a society as a whole um, to just get people opening up more about um, talking about different conditions, whether it's PCOS um, or going through um, periods um, or even um, poverty as well, um, period, period poverty? What do you think that we can do as a society to get us opening up more? I think we it starts by conversations doesn't it we need to engage with these conversations i think we need to stop seeing um the same sort of conversations being head ha, head around like sort of a, just equality diversity we need more than that we need to get to the crux of what the problems in our communities are and we know that this is a problem we know fertility is an issue that we're not talking about we know that we're, we're talking about all the right subjects on social media but are we talking about in the homes or in the schools um, obviously, we've got schools across the UK that are faith based schools. Are them schools talking about it? Um, because I'm, I'm yet to sort of work with sort of faith based organisations who have actively got in touch with us and said, we need to be talking about this in our schools. So we need to be taking the first steps too. It, we can't be relying on the community activists or the, you know, the advocates of the communities to always reach out into the community. We need to sort of take ownership of that because we know it's a problem and we're only gonna make that problem better by engaging ourselves. Um, Neelam, is there any other sort of groups that like yourselves across the country or is it just yourselves at the minute doing it within our community? um there is communities that do there there are charities that do work around period poverty so binti is a great one um but the work that we do around sort of the reproductive issues um we're the only ones that are doing it with a sort of a cultural sensitive lens um our board for example we've got somebody who's chinese um we've got people that are from the black community um we've got somalians we've got so many people from the diverse communities this is so important to represent every community and I think one of the reasons Sisters, you know, was essentially created is I didn't feel like there was a space for someone like me. So I don't want anyone to feel like there's no space for them either. And that's why we're so diverse in our approach. And I, there isn't actually anyone. It's quite sad, actually, but there isn't anyone doing this type of work who is essentially the patient advocate in this area. There's lots of organisations that do work in specific areas. So you've got things like um, Endo UK. Mm -hmm. Um, who specialise in endometriosis, but they don't know how to work with South Asian communities. So we work together. Um, and, and that's what the best thing is, is, is that collaboration and partnership. It's our expertise on the ground and their medical expertise, because we're not the medical experts, we're the patient voice, because the patient voice it deserves to be heard as well. We can't make decisions without them. Yeah, I think another way, you know, another way of getting it through is we could, you know, work with female football clubs or um, sports clubs and you know you could put it through that way as well I mean I'd love to be able to get involved and help help you with that if I could here in the Midlands um, yeah I'd love to that'd be awesome 
Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's just about getting it out there, isn't it? Um, yeah, so, yeah, we've struggled with that, I won't lie. That's something we have really struggled with. I mean, if you look at some of the pictures on our Instagram page, people people still find them a bit, a bit too much or a bit too sexually promiscuous. Um, we had an argument with somebody from in, in the community who was quite well known because she was very offended that we had uh, a picture of a vulva um, and she was like, it's wrong. And I was like, but, but why? Mm. <laughs> a, it's art and, and B, it's a vulva. Um, and I think she got very offended actually because I was like, because she kept calling it a vagina. I was like, actually it's a vulva. <laughs> We don't know our basic anatomy and we need to. But that that was actually a really important conversation because um, I think seven out of 10 women don't actually know their reproductive anatomy. So they don't know, you know, what the endometrial lining is. They don't know what the fallopian tube is. Um, that's important, guys. We need to know. We need to know that. Um, they Some people have never come across a vulva before. I did a talk once where after the talk, and I don't know if it's my accent, I was asked why I was talking about a Volvo, not a vulva. And I was like, what is this? What is this? <laughs> so for me, it just highlights the point that we need to be talking about it. Yeah, 100%. Um, Manisha, Vina, anything, any more questions? Yeah, I mean, you know, we wanted to start up Free Your Mind to actually have and engage in these types of conversations. Um, particularly tackling mental health and taboo within South Asian communities. And, um, you know, what you've spoken about, I think you're 100% right in terms of education, but yeah. it, me included, I think we as women have to become better educated um, with regards to our body and how our body works. And, uh, you know, I'm coming away thinking, oh my God, my mind is, is about to burst uh, just with all these things that you've said that I actually am thinking God, I actually like I wouldn't use the word vulva because I would use vagina and now I'm going away thinking God I'm gonna um, you know no I'm gonna um, think think twice or yeah. no I, I actually need to go and find out more and um, what what key messages would you Neela want to leave people with who would be listening to this the biggest thing is if you've got any of these conditions if you think anything is wrong, reach out because there is a whole supportive sisterhood there for you. I'm I'm accessible. You're, you're not on your own. Like I remember when it was me and I felt so alone. I actually never thought I'd meet anybody. I never thought, I just thought it was like a death sentence. It's really not. Having that, you know, when you've got a condition like this and you meet somebody else with it, there's an instant connection straight away because you don't have to explain yourself to them they already know what you're going through and they've gone through it themselves and I think it's so important to reach out because you have got people there um just on behalf of all of us just uh, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and also your personal experiences uh we we definitely know that it, it will benefit uh the listeners and we hope that you know as a collective there'll be more people um that will be open and, and feel safe enough to actually talk about these things? I really hope so. I just, it honestly breaks my heart that there's gonna be someone out there who's probably sat in pain right now and doesn't know who to turn to. And I, it just breaks me, it really does. We just, just, they deserve so much better. Yeah, definitely. And and these conversations are um, are important to, to that. Yeah. Um, so no, thank you. We really appreciate your time. No, thank you for giving me the platform. I appreciate it.